super exciting, but uh, George is a fifth year uh, doctoral student here in the math department at UT. Um, George's interests include algebraic geometry, uh, tropical uh, geometry, machine learning, and optimization. Uh, and he's funded by the Institute for the Foundations of Machine Learning. And in addition to being a graduate student here, uh, George works, as you mentioned, part-time for a machine learning company in Austin Paul's Triveworks. Um, and yeah, uh, I believe you've given uh, talks to uh, SIAM at UT in the past. Uh, yeah, I give a virtual talk in the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we're uh, grateful to have Triveworks here again uh, for another industry seminar. Yeah, without further ado, are we good on recording? Yeah, uh, we're good on recording. Um, everything yeah. everything should be good. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so yeah, thanks for the introduction and appreciate Sam for having us over here. We love coming to UT and uh, letting you guys know a little bit about what we do. Um, like, I, like you just heard, um, I kind of have my feet in both camps right now. so. Um, hopefully, I can give you a sense of uh, what it is we do, but also give you give you uh, a little bit of uh, the idea. Evan or George, can you hear us? This particular topic, which is theory and practice of generative autoencoders. So, if none of those Evan words make any sense to you, that's okay. We'll uh, make sense of them and um, hopefully get to a cool demo at the end uh, with some stuff that we've worked on. Uh, George, would you? Uh, so. Um, just give a, a, a brief uh, uh, Evan, what I'm going to do is just give Evan, it's hard to hear George. Uh, so could you ask him to uh, keep him close to the mic? Evan? Evan, can you hear us? 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 Not only this topic, but really any topic of machine learning as it relates to uh, our work. So please feel free to fire away with any questions you have for us about Thriveworks and about what we do. We're here to just get to know you guys and uh, uh, just get a little bit of collaboration going. So, <clears throat> George, uh, can you hear us, George? Yes, I can hear you faintly. Uh, yes, so uh, it's very hard to hear what you said, like in the last few minutes, like it was absolutely okay. not audible. So it would be nice if you stand close to the laptop, like if you're standing where you're standing, not in this position, of course, but okay. it would be easier uh, to uh, like listen to you. Otherwise, it's not at all audible. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is stand a little closer to the laptop at the request of people on Zoom. Yeah, that's... That's hopefully gonna let them hear me better. Is this okay? Yes, this is fine. Thank you so much, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is the, no problem. This is fine. Um, okay, so first slide here. I've, I've got a uh, definition here. Autoencoder is a function of the form D circ E. So you first compose it with an, a function E, which takes R capital N to RD. And then you compose it with another function, which goes the other way. Uh, so right now, I've just said these are arbitrary functions right now, nothing interesting. And typically, n is much larger than d. Uh, so there's a graphic, what's going on. The, the x there is kind of the source, the, the input variable. The z is called what is known as the latent variable. And y is the output variable. And uh, if you can sort of guess what, what an autoencoder is supposed to do, it's supposed to take large dimensional things, like in x, r capital N, uh, reduce them to some small dimension uh, through some learned or, or otherwise uh, encoding, like compression or something. And then the decoding is supposed to be able to undo that so that you can recover those, uh, uh, those compressions. Uh, so pretty general framework right here. Um, and just as a visual example here, I've got an um, uh, image from a famous data set called MNIST, which is the uh, 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 28 by 28 binary images of handwritten digits. And this is a common benchmark in machine learning. And what we're doing is we're taking that image, viewing it as a, a, a 28 by 28 vector uh, with entries in the real numbers. And that's the input space. And the latent space is going to be just some 
vector, which is, uh, let's say, 32 dimensional for our purposes. And then the output space is going to be some other 28 by 28 image. Now, what I've shown here is the same or virtually the same image as the output. Um, and that's kind of spoiling what they're supposed to do is non auto encoder is supposed to reconstruct what its inputs do. Uh, so that's kind of the, the one of the main uses of auto encoders, but not the only that's the one that we'll focus on today. Uh, but like I said, auto encoders are useful when F is approximately the identity. So like I said, it should be you encode it then you decode it again, you should get back to something that's roughly the same. Um, and the reason for that that's useful is that they give a deep representation of their inputs by the encoder. So um, like I had alluded to before, instead of storing your large input X, you can store the encoding of X, which is some smaller dimensional thing and recover X reasonably well using the decoder. Uh, this encoding is known as the deep representation of X latent space representation. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really at this point, it could be anything. Um, right now, I haven't defined how the decoder and encoder functions work. So right now, as long as I know that the decoder composed with the encoder get you something that's close to the identity, then uh, this framework should work. Um, but there is kind of a glaring problem with this um, right now, as I've stated it, and that this isn't actually possible if you allow yourself to use all possible inputs uh, in the space R capital N, at least when N is larger than B. And that's simply for dimensionality. You can't compress RN into RD uh, and then uncompress it uh, without any loss. That's, that's not possible. So uh, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that these aren't useful. It's just that you have to restrict yourself to the type of data or distributions that you care about. And then everything else that has nothing to do with what you want doesn't matter. So to be a little more explicit there, we're saying, we restrict ourselves to a low dimensional subset that I call X here, then you can find an autoencoder uh, that approximates the identity on X. And uh, that, that's basically where this use comes from is an autoencoder has a specific task. It's, it says, I can compress uh, images of faces really well. And uh, the, space of, the space of faces within uh, 256 by 256 color images is a relatively low dimensional space within the space of all possible images, color images. So that's what that's, that's what's really meant by uh, this low dimensional subset. Uh, so that's that's just the actual formulation of what this autoencoder is doing is taking this, uh, you take a reconstruction function which, uh, is a loss function that uh, basically tells you if your input and output are similar. And um, you integrate that function over your uh, low dimensional subset. Um, and you should basically get something that's as small as possible. And, and the, the choice of B and E that does that is the optimal auto encoder. So the common choices of reconstruction loss are relatively simple. The first one is there just the L2 loss. You just take the L2 difference of all the coordinates of the images, uh, the, the, the pixels pixel-wise uh, differences. And then uh, the, the one after that is the, the uh, binary cross entropy loss, another common one that's used. Uh, and then and, and there are others as well that, that, are, that are common. But right, right now what I've stated is not something even remotely trackable. This, this argument problem is definitely not solvable exactly because the space of all functions D and E uh, is, is is huge. Um, it's infinite dimensional and it's definitely not something that we can optimally solve, but there are ways to um, solve this by putting some assumptions on what those functions are. And this is where neural networks. Uh, typically they are modeled as neural networks of some kind, they could be convolutional, they could be uh, multi-layer perceptrons, it could be various other types of uh, three-letter acronym uh, neural networks. Uh, so let's just assume that E is, is a function of some neural network parameters, theta one, and D is some neural network theta two with parameters theta two. So those, those parameters basically determine a uh, complete neural network, which starts the input dimension X or uh, 
uh, its dimension is the dimension of the input. And its output is also the dimension of the input. And it kind of bottlenecks at the middle, which is this latent space. Uh, so you stick these two neural networks together. And uh, suddenly you can talk about the um, best way to estimate these parameters to maximize your, uh, your uh, distribution, the distribution of your, to optimize the distribution of your outputs. So this can be viewed as a statistical estimation problem. Uh, so basically what, what this is just saying is that you wanna take uh, the theta that max for a given input X, you wanna take the, the parameters that maximize the probability that that encoding and decoding is distributed according to your, your input distribution capital X, assuming that X is also Uh, so yeah, sorry, I should have written that. So F theta of X is just E composed with D. That's just the auto encoder, E and D. Does that make sense? So theta is equal to theta one comma theta two. Yeah, sorry. Any, any other questions so far? Uh, so here, here's a kind of word of caution for practitioners. Uh, Autoencoders can be too good, and this is a common symptom in a lot of machine learning uh, problems. And this is this example that I'm about to give is not maybe the best, but it's the easiest to explain how they could be too good. Uh, what if I just set e of x equals x and d of x equals x? Then uh, obviously that autoencoder is perfect in the sense that uh, the composition is exactly the identity, but that's pretty useful. Um, the reason that that's not a great example is that I told you earlier that the latent space is smaller than the input space, which is not the case here. The latent space, the input space, and the output space are all the same dimension. So that's not like a, that's not a great example. But even if the the latent space was a little bit smaller, you could still have something that's learning close to the identity in this fashion. That is bad. So there's a sense in which learning the identity is a bad thing because you essentially just teach it to recreate its inputs, which is not what you want. But then there's also learning the identity in the sense that the input and output should be the same. So there, that's kind of a, a subtle difference between these two things. But importantly, the best way to get around this is to just choose your latent space to be much smaller than your input space, and then you kind of avoid this problem manifest. Uh, another, another common practice is to use a regularization term. So back to this uh, argument problem, I just throw in a L2 distance, L2 norm of the, the parameters. And what that does is it encourages the, the network parameters to not be too uh, large and um, to be somewhat sparse. And the reasoning for that is um, that kind of discourages overfitting in general. That's just a general practice in machine learning is the overfitting is solved by adding a regularization term. So those are two things that are typically used to make an autoencoder a bit more, um, a bit, a bit, a bit more performant uh, on actual uh, practical data. Okay, so so far all I've described is what autoencoders are, just from a pretty, pretty broad point of view. I said that an autoencoder is something that uh, takes inputs, maps them into a low dimensional space, and then brings those back up. And the goal is to get them to reproduce their inputs. Uh, the problem is that uh, even when you do this, the latent space isn't super well behaved. Uh, and to explain what that means is, let's just, let's just look at this particular example. Let's say you have a well-trained autoencoder. Uh, and this D is the decoder of that autoencoder. And let's just take a, a, a latent vector x, uh, z, sorry. I'm just going to take any vector z, and I'm going to perturb it by a small amount, epsilon. And you might expect that if you decode that perturbed vector, you should get something moderately close to the decoding of your original vector, um, or small epsilon. So now, now, so these are continuous functions. So in, 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 in some sense, uh, well, I guess, I guess not. But in practice, this doesn't always happen. 
uh, you can't always take a, a, a an encoding of, of, a, of your input, change it by a very small amount and get something that looks pretty close to your input. Um, and that means that your latent, that's a sign that your latent space is, is a little bit overfit. And that means that it's uh, too, it's hypersensitive or, or uh, too, too sensitive to changes within the latent space. So it's, it's not super well behaved. And that's a problem in practice. Uh, another way to say that is that F can have undesirably high Lipschitz quantity. So it, it can be continuous, but, but it changes too fast with a small change. So a generative autoencoder is, is kind of a, a broad term that is used to characterize function autoencoders whose latent space are a bit more, latent spaces are a bit more regularized. Um, and in particular, they can be used to generate new data from, uh, from, from basically nothing that is similar to the training data X. So uh, this is a great image that, that helps uh, visualize what that means. So here I have on the left, a just a standard, let's say autoencoder, where um, the, the orange blob there is say encodings of a triangle. So that, let's say it feeds in images of a triangle and, it's, and the, in the latent space you get vectors and those are all distributed near that little uh, orange ball there. And those are all the encodings of a triangle, similarly for a circle and a square. And the problem is if I pick a point that's not in anywhere, near any of those uh, uh, points in the latent space, say in the middle there, I get some thing that probably decodes to something that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and, that, and that we just observe that phenomenon in the real world, like that just happens. Uh, so what a regularized latent space is meant to do is basically join those uh, together into a more cohesive uh, unified latent space where all the points in the latent space actually represent something meaningful. And that's what's shown on the right, is uh, you've still got three um, separate clusters representing the three different things that we've trained on, but then it can actually meaningfully interpolate between them because it's because of the way the latent space is structured. So there's no kind of dead areas of the latent space. So that's what it means for the data to be distributed uh, similarly to the training set X. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, actually, I actually don't know. Um, so the question, in case it couldn't be heard, um, question from the audience was, can this happen on the left? Um, can this situation happen on the left when say the latent dimension is one? And, and I don't know, uh, that's a really good question. I suppose you could just kind of do it. Uh, you could just write a little autoencoder and see what happens. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, th yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure the answer. To that. Are there any other questions so far before I move on? Okay. So I'm just going to talk briefly about two um, autoencoder architectures that fit within this sort of generative model category. Uh, one is called variational autoencoders due to Hingma and uh, Willing in 2014. And what this does is it imposes a prior on the latent space with an extra loss term. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Then there's adversarial auto autoencoders uh, due to Maxani et al. in 2015. And they also impose a prior on the latent space, but they do this with an adversarial training procedure. Again, I will describe it. Um, I wish I could give a, a, an extremely detailed description of both of these, but just in terms of time and also my limitations, uh, I, I, I can't. So I, at least I'll, I'll, I'll try to communicate what I can about these. And then maybe uh, we can also talk about those at the end uh, if you have more questions. I'll try to communicate what I, what I understand. Okay, so the first one is variational autoencoders. These uh, introduce a Bayesian framework and they, Essentially, the derivation follows the, the, the same derivation that goes for any sort of variational inference framework. So if those are words that are familiar with you, familiar to you, some of these, some of these equations might make sense. Um, so each input is treated as a random variable whose latent vectors are distributed as, say, some P 
z given x. And so you can think of the, the input vectors as being, so let's get, start with an example. Uh, let's say your input images are faces. And so you've got a particular face that's the input, but you want to think of that as a, just a small distribution of faces around that one, which basically just comes from different lighting scenarios, uh, different hairstyles. It's all the same face, but they're all kind of perturbed in slightly different ways. We're modeling that as um, a distribution around X and it's output distribution in the latent space, sorry, not output, the latent distribution, when you feed all those through the, the encoder, uh, those are distributed uh, in some way. And then a prior distribution is chosen on latent space to match that as closely as possible. So what this means is basically you can use your, you can, you can force your encoder to uh, restructure that, that input distribution so that it just matches that prior. How, however, that prior is chosen. So you can choose that prior to be kind of any distribution that you want, say the most typical is Gaussian. And you can also use, use Bernoulli when you're using uh, categorical variables. But importantly, basically this, this just takes um, the, into account the variability of the input and maps that into the latent space and allows the latent space to kind of be thickened up by uh, this, by, by imposing this prior distribution on that latent space. Okay, so then the option, the object is then to maximize this following function. The first term is uh, log of the total probability of x. What that means is basically you just want to maximize the fact that x is actually distributed uh, as you want it to be. And then this KL divergence, which is the second term, is a measure of the difference between how different these two distributions are. There's the prior distribution, which is what we want to match it to. And then there's uh, P of Z given X, which is the actual distribution. And you, wanna, you want those to be um, matched as close as possible because that's kind of what you're imposing on, on the latent space. So if you wanna minimize that KL divergence, you want, then want to maximize minus the KL divergence. So you're kind of jointly optimizing these two quantities. Um, if that felt a little hand wavy, you're not alone. There's a lot of justification between what I claimed at the beginning and this uh, loss function. Um, I, I urge you to consult the paper, which I'll cite at the end if you're really curious about the actual framework for why that's what needs to be optimized. Uh, using Bayes' rule and some kind of basic uh, computations, you can actually re rewrite that loss function as this following one. Uh, the expected value of log of p x given z minus a KL divergence of something slightly different. And all I want to highlight here is that this first term is actually a reconstruction loss. Um, that's because p of x given z is basically the probability of your, it's, it's, it's a distribution that takes your latent variable and returns your uh, uh, deconstructed uh, variable. And you're assuming that the output is going to have some sort of Gaussian fuzz to it. So the log of that is going to be some, some Gaussian exponential, so e to the x minus x hat squared, something like that. Uh, take the log of that, you just get the difference of squares. So what this is doing is it's the expected value of, of a difference of squares. And that's like a reconstruction. Again, that. I highly encourage you to consult the paper if that didn't make sense. It took me about 20 times to read it before I understood that myself. So, um, and then this KL divergence is something that also pops out. The nice thing about this, both of these terms is that they're very computable. This expected value can just be computed through some stochastic gradient descent methods. And this KL divergence can be uh, computed just analytically if you choose the right prior distribution. So you can choose a really simple prior, say uh, unit Gaussian. And instead of using this uh, expected value reconstruction, sometimes people just sub it out for a, 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 an explicit reconstruction term. Um, so you could use uh, the difference of squares explicitly, you could use binary cross entropy, any sort of reconstruction loss between the input and output. You want to measure how different those are, that's, that's fine. So then that's the final form, a natural loss function. And also, I stuck in here. Um, mu and sigma thetas. The mu and sigma theta are essentially the mean and standard deviation of the output distribution P 
in the latent space, P of Z given X. And those are parameters that are learned by the neural network. Um, so in a sense, you could think of the network as outputting the mean and standard deviation within the latent space. And then you sample from that. And that's what actually gives you the vector that you feed through the decoder. So here's a diagram of how that works. You start life as X at the bottom and you go through your neural network encoder. And that neural network is actually trained to spit out two vectors. One is the mean, which we're calling mu X, and the other is the covariance matrix sigma. Um, those two combine to give you a, those parameterize a normal distribution. That red box is what that's doing is that it's sampling from that normal distribution that you just created through a neural network. And it samples from that some Z. And then that Z goes through the decoder, becomes some uh, deconstructed image. And then you, then at the top there, you, 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 you check the, whether or not it's reconstructed correctly using that difference of squares term. Uh, so that blue box has the reconstruction error. Is the top blue box, the bottom blue box has the uh, KL divergence term. And so really at kind of a practical level, what's going on is a normal autoencoder just gives you one latent variable, which you then decode. Uh, a variational autoencoder actually gives you a distribution in your latent space. That distribution is, is characterized by mu and sigma. So every time you feed it through, you actually get a different answer. If you keep all the parameters still and everything, you get a, you get a different answer every time you feed it through because it's naturally stochastic. So you say, feed it through once, you get the same mean and covariance, but then your instructions are to sample from that distribution within the latent space with that mean and covariance. You get a different uh, latent vector Z, which you then decode. Yes, yes, exactly. So the latent space is now random variable. Everything's a random variable. Yeah. Uh, and I guess, I guess this also, it basically, to me at an in, intuitive level, this helps me understand, um, you know, why, why, would this be, why would this be something that is useful? Why would this regularize your latent space at all? Well, what this allows it to do is take into account variations in your input, which are small, but still should be accounted for when you're feeding through. So every time you train your network, it kind of bounces around a little bit and the stochasticity of the, of the feed forward part actually allows it to be robust to small changes in the input, as well as small changes in, in the output space, in, in the latent space. That's kind of vaguely what, what, what I see when I, when I think. Okay, um, then there's adversarial autoencoders. These are uh, very similar in the sense that they both, it also tries to impose this prior distribution on the latent space, um, but it does it through, through a slightly different way. So um, in fact, actually this one is less mathematical. It's, it's really just a diagram. Um, so hopefully, this, uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you can see it, but what this is doing is it, it introduces a separate, what's called the discriminator network. So if you ignore the, the bottom discriminator part for now, just ignore that bottom half and look at the top half, that's just our standard vanilla encoder and decoder framework. We've got our input uh, image, goes through some uh, convolutional layers or whatever. We've got some uh, latent vector in the gray and then it decodes and, uh, and, and should be something like it started with. The bottom of the discriminator is taking that latent vector and it's basically deciding, is that latent vector sampled from a normal distribution that I chose, or is it not? That's, a, that's basically, it's, a, it's learning to discriminate between a true sample from a normal distribution and this latent vector, which is pretending to be from a normal distribution. Uh, so when you start off training and you have this discriminator, it's not really, not, nothing knows anything. The discriminator doesn't know, doesn't know how to do anything, and neither does the encoder and decoder. So they're kind of both fumbling around. But as you sort of pit them against each other, um, this is sort of much 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 similar to the the uh, the GAN framework, the generative adversarial network framework. 
uh, that, that was pioneered in 2014. George? Uh, yes. There are a few questions uh, in the chat. So what is the effect of using a different prior on the latent space? Uh, it's asked by Jonathan. Could you say it again? So what is the effect? So uh, what is the effect of using a different prior on the latent space? Okay. So the question from online was, what is the effect of using a different prior on the latent space? So that prior here was uh, a unit Gaussian. Um, I don't think that there's a significant effect uh, if I were to choose a different Gaussian or, or even a, just a different distribution. You do have to choose a different one depending on if you're using continuous variables or categorical variables, uh, because it just there's no, I mean, if you're, if you're categorical variable, there's no Gaussian distribution there. But other than that, I don't think there's a significant effect. Uh, and I think that pretty much across the field, uh, both in research and practice, the unit Gaussian is used. That makes sense. Thank you. And one more question by Tyler. So if you validate against a training set, uh, can you make only probabilistic statements, right? Can you say so, that one more time? So if you validate against a training set, uh, you can only make probabilistic statements. Is that correct? Oh, I see. Okay. I can actually read them here. So, okay, perfect. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So if you were to validate against a training set, you can only make probabilistic statements. Correct. Um, so what I th think this is saying is that since this is a stochastic process, uh, your output is only going to be uh, up to some distribution. Basically your output's not going to be deterministic. Um, that's true. Uh, so if you want to actually evaluate this, um, typically what happens is that you actually just freeze the parameters uh, and you, um, there, so there's a, there's a little bit of nuance that goes into how these are implemented. And, and one of them is called the reparameterization trick, which basically is a, is a way to, to, to evaluate these things without directly sampling within that latent space, because that's not, you can't back propagate for auto differentiation. So there, there's some, there are kind of some technicalities with how these are implemented that allows you to so-called freeze the sampling process where it's actually deterministic. And what, what actually it comes down to is, is fixing an outside generator of, of random unit Gaussian samples. And that's actually used as input for the network every time. And uh, what I believe happens is that that outside generator just gets fixed with a, with a seed. And that's what makes it that's what makes it deterministic, so that you can make uh, actual predictions instead of just uh, stochastically varying ones. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, good point. Yeah, yeah. So it's not precise. Like it's not precise to say what that means for random variables, but. Um, this is kind of just a, a, a low level description of what's going on. Um, like I said, uh, there, there's, there's some details here that they are fully fleshed out in these papers, but um, for, the, for the essence of time and clarity, I've kind of brushed over those. Good point. Are there any other questions so far? Yeah, so the, the, the comment was, we sacrifice the deterministic results for a, a more robust autoencoding. And that's correct, yeah. Um, and I think the deterministic requirement is a, little less, is a little less strict for some applications than others. So people are perfectly fine with a non-deterministic model as long as it does uh, what they need in, in the latent space. So back to this, uh, back to this adversarial autoencoder. Um, so there's a discriminator that basically is is tasked with determining whether or not this latent vector is sampled from your from your prior distribution, which we'll say is a unit Gaussian. Uh, and what it does is it takes an actual true sample from a unit Gaussian, and then your latent vector, and it tries as some some network structure, some uh, multi-layer perceptron or something that uh, 
uh, outputs a, a uh, scalar value, which says yes or no, is that a, uh, from a true uh, Gaussian. And that discriminator is used uh, so that you can basically enforce this uh, latent space to have your prior distribution. Uh, and so this is just another framework. This is really in the training framework and less in the architectural framework. This is how it's trained uh, is much similar to a GAN uh, for imposing that, that prior in the uh, latent space. But in, in this case, this is actually a deterministic model. It's not stochastic. Okay, uh, finally, there's this last, um, this last type of autoencoder is something I will actually not explain at all because uh, it would take too long to do so. But the only reason I'm mentioning it is because this is what we're actually using for the demo. So this is called the adversarial latent autoencoder, well-known modern example uh, of a generative autoencoder. Um, and it uses a lot of the same characteristics uh, and ideas from these first two that I introduced, but it's a bit more sophisticated and how it trains and how it's uh, built. Um, but the advantage of this one is that it, it, it's, it's remarkably sharp. It works really, really well. Um, and uh, in particular, this is something that, that we at Striveworks had done some experimentation with um, for some of our work to just kind of guide some of our R&D efforts. So um, to kind of just bring this to a close here, what I want to do is just give you an example of, of, of how this thing works. So um, you know, I just fired it up myself and um, took the liberty of grabbing some images of myself made here and then uh, another of our engineers, Eric Foreman, who's a postdoc here, so all UT people on this picture. Um, what I did was I just took our photos, made sure they were square, and then I fed them through this uh, autoencoder. So what we should be getting is something that is uh, on a, you know, something that's similar in some sense to the input image. And eerily enough, uh, kind of put your eyes, I would believe it. But I think the most remarkable part about this is that these are faces which are similar, but they're also not the same. They're definitively not the same, but they also are of people that just don't exist. Right? <laughs> um, so I find that I find that really interesting that um, so, like I said, this, this is a very, very good and sharp model in the sense that the outputs are extremely high um, fidelity, but they're also not perfect at the reconstruction part. And there's that, there's that kind of balance between um, how good you are at reconstructing your input perfectly and being uh, having a, a robust latent space. And this one kind of, kind of tends towards more having a robust latent space at the sacrifice of not being perfect at reconstruction. So um, finally, what I'm going to do is I have a uh, demo here of, okay, yeah. So I've got a um, video of so what I'm doing here is, can everyone on Zoom see this? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking those three face those three faces. I'm taking their latent vectors. I've got one latent vector for each face, and what I'm doing is I'm just interpolating between them using a straight line. So I just take two vectors. I take the straight line between them, and I've got a, a whole line of uh, latent variables, and I just decode every point on that line. Uh, and let me put this on loop. I decode every point on that line, and I just do it for each line. So it makes a loop of, of spaces. I thought this was kind of neat because it kind of shows you how robust the actual latent space of this model is. That really shows that it's able to sample, it's able to interpolate between uh, latent uh, variables really, really well. Um, in particular, I really like how the, the glasses just kind of appear out of nowhere and then disappear. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's actually pretty incredible. Um, I, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fake Eric here with the glasses. Um, so I, I, I have done a very significant amount of uh, playing with this model. And unfortunately, I don't have any of those uh, images with me, but there's some pretty horrifying images that come out sometimes if you feed it kind of weird stuff. Uh, it's fun to play with, 
especially if you feed it like uh, an image of, let's say a chair or something that's just completely not a face at all. It kind of returns something that's face, but it's not a face you'd ever want to see. Uh, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, so yeah, this is the adversarial latent autoencoder uh, trained in uh, 2020 here. And it's an extremely great example of, of generative autoencoders and the power of a, of a well-trained latent space. Yeah. Good question. So for the people on Zoom, the question was, um, is there any way to interpret, or has there been any attempts to interpret the variables in the latent space for this type of uh, model? My knowledge for something this big, this is quite a big model. The latent space is, I believe, 512 times 18 dimensional, so pretty huge. Um, I, I don't believe that there's been any like serious attempts at getting this to um, understanding what those particular variables each dimension represents. But um, I know that there is some analysis that you can do with just using these for just dimensionality reduction. Um, you just maybe map them down to R2 and, and view how different faces uh, are, are positioned within the coordinate plane. That's kind of a rudimentary way to do it. But other than that, there's nothing to my knowledge that, that tries to interpret this. Yeah, 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 that, yeah, great question. Yeah, so yeah, for those online, um, there might be some way to, to, use, uh, to, to, to use those latent variables to detect if there's glasses in the face or not. Yeah, great question. Yeah. 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 So the question was, um, is there a way to use these, or is there some way to to leverage these to uh, get an estimate of the intrinsic dimension of your training data? So the dimension of that uh, that uh, holographic X that I put on the slides, I believe. Uh, the definition of dimension here is it can be kind of a little tricky because you have to really know what the set of faces is, <laughs> and that's not something we can really define. So I could I could I could convince myself that the set of faces is full dimensional in the set of say two fifty six by two fifty six images because uh, I could I could I could kind of take any face and perturb it enough to have a, a big enough envelope in any pixel that um, it would be full dimensional. I, I could believe that. So that's, that's sort of my, my guess is that I think it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really easy to even define what you would want to do there. Um, there are some questions about, some, there are some kind of related topics in manifold learning um, that, that are related to that. It's not specifically necessarily manifolds or not, not maybe like this robust is like faces, but maybe data that is structured in a manifold that you know should be causally in a particular shape or uh, take some particular low dimensional subset. In that case, then, yeah, I think that there could be some use for this, but I don't know any, any of that. Yeah, I'm just curious. George, uh, George, can you hear us? There's one question in the chat. Can you have a gotcha. look at it? Yeah. 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 The dimensionality of the latent spaces. It's it's a complicated question and something that people play with to this day. So I'll get to your question. There's a question on the line. Can you repeat that? So there's a question in the chat. Can you have a look at oh. it? Uh, so can I talk about the cost of training the autoencoder with a number of layers? Um, for this particular one, I don't know. Um, it might, I don't think they put it in a paper for this, for this autoencoder, what the cost was for training it. Um, I think they tend to be pretty expensive if you're going to go for something as high fidelity as this uh, in terms of uh, cycles or however you want to measure it. But uh, 
Yeah, if you want something that's very good and, and very specialized, they, they tend to be fairly expensive because they kind of rely on, on some um, pretty hefty backbones that they use to bootstrap up to, to a model. Oh yeah, I don't know, I, I yeah. But um, uh, let me bring up the slides here so I can um, show you the uh, references in case anyone wants them. The last reference there. Um, so what I want to do now is just um, kind of put a soft close to this. I know that the math department has a, a thing at, at social at three that if anyone needs to go to that, they can go to. Um, but also importantly, I'm, I'm here with Abe to just kind of talk with you about Dryworks more in general. What do we do? Why did we care about this? Um, and uh, you know, anything machine learning related and, and to what we do, we're happy to answer questions. Like that. <clears throat> Oh yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I get that like you have this generative ability that can all make questions come with associated math from your like your stuff. Um, does that make sense? Um, but I, I had like a, a friend who works in machine learning and she used an auto encoder purely for the purposes of reducing the dimension of some data mm. for the purposes of being more granular. I, I didn't know why. Like she used an auto encoder as opposed to some other like dimension about the control. Good question. I don't know exactly the breadth of all dimension reduction techniques other than PCA and uh, a few others, but obviously PCA is linear, not going to work very well for uh, general data. Autoencoders are nonlinear. Um, another reason, another thing that makes autoencoders favorable is that, like most uh, most of the reasons, most reasons people find um, neural networks favorable in general is that they, the cost for training them can be loaded up front, and then the actual feed forward the, using it is really fast because it can be implemented in parallel, uh, and it doesn't. Have, it's it's pretty low cost to actually use it. So. Um, that's, that might be one example of someone wanting to use an autoencoder for, for dimensionality reduction because of just the efficiency involved. Um, when you think about it, an autoencoder is really just a way, it's just a way to learn the dimensionality reduction. That's just, the decoder is also part of it, but the encoder and the decoder are, are kind of separate things. So if you just kind of ignore the decoder, that's really what an autoencoder is. It's, it's a dimensionality reduction. So that's perhaps another way to think of it is just just kind of naively, that's what you should do <laughs> if you wanted to do dimensionality reduction using a neural network. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. If D and E are linear, then you get PCA. Also, maybe you can just like there was a talk here at the Odin Alex Demontis from the CS Science Center, and he was talking about generative uh, autoencoders providing a prior for reduced reduction. So if you're trying to do human training, for example, that's an inverse problem, and you want some prior. Seems like um, generative adversarial uh, or, or generative autoencoders are more high value. Yeah. Uh, Uh, no, I, I haven't, I haven't read anything about that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point is, is uh, a lot of times 
no one really knows what's going on uh, with any of this. So it's, it's mostly just heuristics at some level, uh, which is just machine learning research in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, maybe there are some experts out there who would disagree. But so far, that's what I think. <laughs> Good question. Um, so autoencoders have a uh, the benefit of a the latent space representation. Uh, so the, the way to encode your images. And that's what, that's, that's I think, a, a good example of what a lot of um, people use them for, not just us. So, but for our, our particular purposes, we care about them because we can have data that comes through and we want to say, be able to recognize, hey, this is a car. And this is a car that I've seen uh, a long time ago but they have a very similar latent space representation. So I can actually conclude with some confidence that they're actually the same car. Yeah. So this ends up being a measure of like a distance. Yeah, so yeah. You can compare two distances. Exactly. It gives you a handle on an image that is not pixel-wise. Pixel-wise uh, metrics are extremely bad. For, for images, you try to take two images and see if they're different by taking the difference of every pixel, you get garbage results. Because for one, you could have just a, the same car, but in two different spots of the image. And then like, of course, there's nothing useful there, but the difference would give you nothing, right? But, but the encoding uh, captures that. And so the idea is that the encoding vectors you can use as a much more tractable handle for actually doing analysis on images have some content that you care about. Yeah, so you hope that the encoder is uh, invariant with respect to translation. Yes. The approximation. Yeah, so exactly. Um, OK. Yeah. I wonder if you want to construct data sets with physics in mind, I mean, uh, or, or if that has to be or explicit. Um, yeah, I don't know for sure, but I know that there has been some uh, work in, in constructing data sets using like um, video games. So, like you could take some of the 3D renders from GTA 5, like the cars and stuff like that. It, you can render them in some engine and then actually get synthetic data sets where you see every direct, every angle and lighting situation of the car. And you create that as a data set, which then you train on. And that gives you a ton of data for free, basically, because it's all uh, synthetically generated. Um, there's some papers out there on that that I don't remember who they were by, but that's definitely been done before in, in several, several scenarios. How did I compute the what? So thank you all for joining us online. I know uh, this is our first time uh, hosting an online or, or a hybrid talk. So sorry for the trouble. Uh, I we understand that there were some issues with uh, hearing. So uh, we would like to uh, take care of that in future. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, George, for such a wonderful talk. It was really informative. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have any, any uh, questions or anything, feel free to uh, connect with George. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>